Hey everybody, and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. Now there is so much to get to today. We have new releases from Amazon, perhaps Rafe's most revealing Q&A yet, and some casting and filming announcements about the Wheel of Time television adaptation on Amazon. Not to mention, we have some fairly controversial topics to discuss about some of the changes that we've learned are coming with the adaptation. Today's gonna be a packed out video. Now first, let me thank the video's sponsor, Bespoke Post, but we will talk more about them in a little bit. Now, I wanna quickly mention that I do have a new YouTube channel as well. Now, I've mentioned this a few times on my live streams over on Twitch, but I am starting a movie and television show review channel as well. Now, Wheel of Time is obviously one of my main passions, but another of my passions is movies. I love to talk about them. I love to get really geeky and nerd out over them. And I appreciate a lot of good films from all kinds of genres. And I really, really enjoy making fun of bad movies. So. I started the Nablus Reviews channel to be able to explore that a little bit more. I'll be releasing videos over there uh, quite a bit. In addition to here, that won't take away anything from this channel. Now, getting started all over again on YouTube is always a blast, starting from like going from having a lot of views to, well, none. <laughs> but if you wanna help or check that channel out, please consider subscribing to my new channel and checking out my videos there. The channel is called Nablus Reviews, and I have it linked in the description of this video. So let's go ahead and hit the spoiler warning for the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red, with major spoilers running all the way through The Great Hunt. If you have not finished the second book of the series, go do that, come back, and then watch this video. All right, so there's absolutely a ton to get to, so I want to start off with some of the older news from earlier this month, but I do think it's worth talking about. This information comes via wattseries.com, where like all of the information comes from. According to Watt series, four new actors have been associated with the production and the filming that took place in Segovia, Spain, back at the end of November, early December. Now those actors were Miguel Alvarez, Zeke Fernandez, Brandy Rodriguez, and Rebecca Tanwin. Now none of these actors are particularly famous and none of them have had any major starring roles that I could find. And we only know the role for Miguel Alvarez. He will be playing the role of the King of Gildon in the adaptation. Now the role has a given name of Arthur, but that's not clear if that's just the, the code name for the role or if that's his actual name. In the books, the King of Gildon at the time of Loghain's capture was named Johanan, but he doesn't have a speaking part or even appear on the page outside of just mentioning him. So. It doesn't really matter what his name is. We've also known they would be adding to Loghain's storyline and the filming in Spain seems primarily focused around that plot. Um, as Alvaro Morte, the actor playing Loghain, was seen in Segovia during the filming, and it seems like they're kind of going with a Spanish overtone for Gildon. Now, one of the other important pieces of information that Watt series uncovered pertains to the director and cinematographers for the Segovia shoot, Paco Cabezas, a Spanish director, was tapped to direct the scenes in Segovia. Now, Paco is known for works on series like Penny Dreadful, Into the Badlands, and American Gods. Additionally, Pablo Rosso is listed as the cinematographer for these scenes. Now, what's important here is that Paco was listed as the director alongside Wayne Yip for the filming Block 2, which was episodes 3 and 4 of season 1. Now, this would seem to indicate that the filming that was taking place in Spain was for block two and not for block four, as some people had speculated. Now that seems to indicate that Logan's capture will take place in block two. So again, either episodes three or four. For more detailed breakdowns on those filming blocks, the production schedule, all of that stuff, a great resource for all of you is Geeky Eerie in her YouTube channel and all of her videos. I'm gonna have her channel linked in the description of this video, but it is a great place to learn about all of the production. It's really, really good stuff. She's also one of the writers on wattseries.com, so go check her out. So, okay, let's move on to some super exciting stuff. This past Watt Wednesday, we got another prop release and a short bit of dialogue. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and play the clip here and then we'll break it down. I'm not gonna play it with the sound as YouTube kind of flags the music and this song from the clip is actually not from the show. This is a song called Meet Your Maker, and it's from a film score composer named Adam Peters, who's actually really good, by the way. So it is not a song from the show, to be clear, so that's why I'm just going to cut it out. I will have the actual clip linked in the description so you can watch it with sound if you want.
So, it's a cool video and I'm a fan of these prop releases. They are really cool in my opinion. They give us some insight into the way they are thinking through adapting the, the series and all of the props. So I want to start by breaking down the script portion though. This appears to be a part in the script where Tom Marilyn is introduced. Now for one, the context of the wording makes it seem like this is the first time that we're seeing him. But additionally, in screenplays, when a name is in all capital letters, it typically indicates that that is the character's first appearance. Shout out to Lauren from Unraveling the Pattern for that info. That is not from me. That's all him. Now, the rest of the script here is blurred out, and there have been several attempts to piece together what the blurred sections are saying from all kinds of people. The best of those that I could find comes from Twitter user Steven Tiro, who put what you're seeing on the screen together. Now, I don't know if I see exactly what he sees, but it certainly looks plausible. I'm half blind, so I can't tell anyway. Additionally, the blurred word at the bottom of the page indicates that this might be the end of an episode. So perhaps indicating Tom's introduction will come at the end of an episode, setting him up for a longer appearance in the following episode. We already know that Alexandra Willem, the actor cast to play Tom Marilyn, was not part of the Block 1 filming, but was a part of Block 2. So basically that means that his introduction is not likely to come in Emmons Field, but rather sometime later, and the script would seem to confirm that. Now, where would that be? We're going to come back to that topic as Rafe sort of addresses it in his Q&A, uh, which we're going to cover in a minute. So let's talk about the prop itself right now. The diagram is of the construction of Tom's guitar, which is clearly not a harp or a flute. Now this is clearly a departure from the books, but as it was indicated in the Twitter release from this stuff, this is a deliberate change from the showrunners. They did this consciously. They were not doing this by accident and didn't know that Tom played a different instrument. They did it on purpose. So in terms of discussing that change and whether or not I like it or not, we're going to come back to that because Rafe is going to talk about this a little in his Q&A, and I want to give my opinion after that. But let's talk about the guitar itself and its design. It sort of has a worn and used look. It's not incredibly ornate, uh, and it appears to be kind of a smaller guitar. Uh, it's not a huge one. It's, a, it's almost like a little hand guitar that you might hold in your hands like this. I kind of like the look of it. I don't think it needs to be ornate. It sort of fits the, the Gleeman. It's not necessarily something that you would expect a court bard, but at this time, Tom isn't a court bard. He's a Gleeman. I also want to mention where the guitar is located in this shot. Sarah Nakamura wanted us to be aware during the announcement that the setting for the prop was also impressive, and I agree. This appears to be an inn in a very well put together inn, I might add. Uh, and it might be the end that we meet Tom in. I love the attention to detail uh, in this shot. It's beautiful. Look at the flooring, the way the furniture is put together. I even love the lighting with the candlelight. Like, it's definitely a very real feel to it. I love it. Like I said, I'm going to save my opinion about the changes here, like, from the books until at the very end, because I want to get through Rafe's Q&A before doing that. But before addressing the Q&A, I want to open this box from Bespoke Post. They sent me a Christmas present. For those of you who are not aware, Bespoke Post is a primary sponsor for the channel and this video. Now, what Bespoke Post does is they send out these subscription boxes that have a lot of really cool stuff in them. You pay a small fee, and what they do is they kind of gather a bunch of really expensive, normally, items. They put them together into things they think you're going to like based on some preferences, and they send it out to you. And the reason they can do it for so cheap is because they buy so many of them in bulk. And so it's actually really darn cool the way it works. So we're gonna go ahead and do a bit of an unboxing here. Uh, I'll show you what I got. We'll do it quickly here because we got a ton to get to in this video. And if you guys like this stuff, you can check out and get your own box in the description of the video. So let's go ahead and dive into the box. Now, again, it's not a gigantic box, but they fit a lot of stuff in here. Um, let me go ahead and we'll open this. I love the packaging. Now, what I got here was called the Frontier Box. So it comes with all this stuff here. We're going to pull it out one by one. The first thing that I catch out of this is this bag that has... We'll go ahead and open it up. I'm not even sure what is in it. Oh, I might want to untie it. So this is ink to the pen that they sent. This is a bottle opener, which, wow, this is like substantial and like heavy metal and real leather here. Um, you can see this. That's actually like a really cool bottle opener. And it's, I'm probably going to use this as a keychain or something. 
Now this is pretty awesome. This is a knife that they've got. It's a very high quality. Like I like the feel of it. It's really light. This could fit in my pocket. It folds up, but it's got that. It's got a real handy look to it. And then again, we have more ink cartridges here for the pen. And then lastly, I got this really cool leather notebook that they sent me. Ooh, that paper is like, it almost feels like, um, it almost feels like uh, fabric is for the paper. That's really, really darn cool. And so I want to open this pen too. It's a, um, so let me write something with it. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's really cool. Guys, so I highly recommend this stuff. This is a lot of fun. I'm going to cut myself with this. But you can get, this is the Frontier box. There's all kinds of boxes. Check out that website or the link in the description. You can get a pretty cool deal on it. I love this service. I can't wait for my next one. I use pretty much everything I get, and I'm excited for more. So let's get back to the video. All right, let's take some time to look at Wheel of Time showrunner Rafe Judkins Q&A one question at a time, and then I'll give kind of my reaction to each one of these. If you're not familiar, he did a Q&A session basically on Instagram where he let fans basically live send him questions, and then he would answer them over Instagram. I covered this on the Dusty Wheel with Matt, uh, Matt Hatch from the Dusty Wheel, right there. Uh, if you want to see that live reaction, you can watch that video after this one. It's like two hours long. I've had a little bit more time to formulate my thoughts, and I want to give them to you here. So we'll start with question one. Rafe was asked, who was the most significant season one character you invented for the show? And he answered, there is no one fully invented. Anyone new is either a character pulled from somewhere in the series and changed, or a composite of groups or types of characters personified in one individual, other than Steve obviously. Now, I think this is kind of refreshing to a degree. There really isn't a need to invent brand new characters, given that there are like 2,600 plus named characters in the series. I think that it's clear that in any adaptation, they're going to need to change or combine some characters, especially in a series this big. So this makes some sense. I like that they're not inventing people. They're kind of pulling them all together. And I think that was obvious to almost anybody that they were going to need to do that. Next question, Rafe was asked, how difficult was it to change or leave out characters from the books for the screen adaptation? And Rafe answered, sometimes very difficult, obviously. People who drive the story or shed light on our characters' backstories or the world of the show will always be more likely to make an appearance. But some people are there in glimpses or subtle nods just for our enjoyment. Some extras were named as characters or given things or looks from the book, so keep your eyes peeled. So I have a couple takeaways from this one. One is this was always going to happen. As I just said, there are 2,600 plus named characters in The Wheel of Time. We are never going to see all of those people get them on screen, get points of view from them, or get lines from them. But second, I love that they're going to be putting Easter eggs throughout the show. I can't wait to go through each episode and figure out who all of the extras are supposed to be and get subtle hints from the books basically on the screen. I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. You're definitely going to be seeing those videos from me. Next question, Rafe was asked, how many times did I give you blank stares when discussing possible changes? And Rafe answered, this one is obviously from Sarah N. Sarah Nakamura. There were moments when a thrilled room of writers would look, would go, we've cracked it, it's amazing, but can insert book canon person or place thing be insert non-canon idea instead. And Sarah's resounding, withering stare would tell us to go back to the drawing board, R.I.P. Perrin talking to a bear. So who else is thankful for Sarah Nakamura? Honestly, though, what's worth talking about here is the way that the writers do adapt stories. Because as I read this, I know what a lot of people are going to say and think about it. Your head kind of immediately goes to that place. If they considered changing Perrin to talking to bears, that's scary to me. What else are they going to change? I'm scared that they would even consider that. Now I'm terrified about the series, right? I think there's a lot of you that probably have that thought. And honestly, I don't think it's a bad thought. It is concerning that such a major part of the story would be changed. And what else could they be planning these huge dramatic changes for? Well, Let's talk about the reason for that specific suggestion. At the time they were writing season one of The Wheel of Time, Game of Thrones was still on air, and if you haven't seen Game of Thrones, there was a major emphasis on wolves, 
and their relationship with the Starks, and I think there was certainly a lot of fear with Wheel of Time feeling like it was copying from that. That conversation probably went something along the lines of, what other animals could work that wouldn't be wolves so they won't think we're ripping off Game of Thrones? They suggested bears, and it was shot down by Sarah successfully, and she campaigned for why that wouldn't feel like necessarily a ripoff of Game of Thrones, and why it was necessary for Wheel of Time, and she won that battle, and we are getting wolves. We know that from leaks. That's her role on the show, guys. And so to be clear, this isn't indicative of some major push to change everything for no reason, and there are guardrails in place to prevent major changes that drift away from the core of the story. Now, this is going to come up again in the Q&A, so I'm going to come back to this specific topic. So Rafe was then asked, in the books, we always enter the story on the wind. Will that be a convention that we see a lot? And Rafe answered, we've tackled the wind in the pilot in what I think at least, ha, is an unexpected but rewarding way. Excited to see what you all think of it. Now, I'm pretty excited to see this personally. It's a cool thing that happens at the beginning of each book of the series. I can't wait to see how they tackle that in the adaptation. It's not something I'm going to lose my mind over if they don't nail it. But I like that they're kind of intertwining that in in a way that I think will make sense for most people, not just book fans. Rafe was asked, do you have to change character personalities for a screen adaptation? He answered, we try not to. Most of our job is about making sure that we create a story and scenes that can tell the audience about character motivations and why they're doing something they're doing when we can't just drop into their head and say it like you can in a book. This often results in some of the biggest changes but they're ultimately put in to make sure a character on screen is as emotionally true as possible. Now, I think this comment addresses some of the challenges in an adaptation and why some changes are a lot of times necessary just to keep it actually the same as the book. Now, think about how much internal monologue shapes the, the plot and the character development in The Wheel of Time. There is far more of that going on in characters' heads than there is actual dialogue in the books. And so that's the main challenge of how to show that without changing the character's personalities. Sometimes scenes or circumstances are gonna to need to be written to communicate who a character is because you can't just tell the audience by letting us hear their thoughts. So I think this is a positive comment from Rafe because it also addresses the motivations they have for any of the changes they make. And those changes are there to keep character development and personalities real, which to me is far more important than minor plot points or whether Tom used a guitar in the books or not. So Rafe was asked, were there any changes in earlier drafts of scripts that were scrapped in the final version? And Rafe answered, yes, tons. We were never afraid to try something and see if it works. But then that also has to go through Sarah and me. I drive the writers as crazy as anyone with sticking to the books. It also then goes to Brandon Sanderson, Harriet McDougall, and Maria Simmons, who've been huge helps in checking us to make sure that we go back to the drawing board on changes, or many times saying, that works, and giving us permission to release a tiny sigh of relief. Again, this is more insight into the process and the guardrails that are in place before making any major changes that wouldn't benefit the adaptation from book to screen. They have a process where any changes have to go through not only Rafe and Sarah, who are both super fans, but also the entirety of Team Jordan, which includes Brandon Sanderson, but more importantly, Maria and Harriet, who are the main editors and assistants to Robert Jordan himself. Obviously, Harriet was Robert Jordan's wife, and Maria was his primary assistant, and she's the one that holds all the notes. This can assure you that there were no changes that were made that were totally against the wishes of the, the team behind the books. I know there's a lot of people that seem to think that Rafe is just making willy-nilly changes, and Harriet is just up beside herself because she's furious because she accidentally signed the rights away to somebody who wants to butcher the books. That could not be further from the truth. Those people have been involved in the production the entire time, they're behind this, and so you should feel good about this to a degree. So Rafe was asked, are there some major characters that appear in the first book that will, won't appear in the first season? And Rafe answered yes, and some of them are still slated to appear in the later seasons, again approaching the adaptation of the series, not just each book individually. A few of these characters I bet you already expect this for, and one at least I think will surprise you. Oh boy, uh, there we go. This is a huge answer from Rafe, and it essentially confirms a few things that some of us were expecting. Now, although he doesn't come right out and say it, I think that it can be assumed from this statement that the Tracans and the entire party of people associated with the Royal Palace in Andor, including Elida, Gareth Brynn, Talonvor, all of them are not going to make it into the first season of the show. 
This is something that I've been predicting for months. I don't think it makes sense for them to cast people that are going to have nothing more than a glorified cameo in season one. They would either have to drastically expand their parts to get anybody of high caliber or somebody that would be worth paying to come do it, or they'd have to cut them entirely for the first season and it sounds like they've decided to cut them. Now in terms of the surprise cut, I think that's probably a Shamael. I am thinking that we're not actually gonna get any of the Forsaken in season one outright. I think it's entirely possible for the Shadow to be a villain for the first season and not introduce the Forsaken yet. Fane is a villain, the White Cloaks are villains, Trollocs and Murdral are as well. Rand's dreams don't have to include a Shamael for them to show things like Aes Sedai using him or really even something terrifying. And most of all, the Eye of the World doesn't have to be the focal point or the end point for the season to the degree that you need a boss fight to have the season get closure. I think there are ways to accomplish this, and I think that's the route that they're going. We really don't need to see a Shamael fighting Rand three seasons in a row like the books. I think there were always going to be some changes to Eye of the World, and I think that this could make some sense. I'm actually genuinely interested to see where they take it. So Rafe was then asked, have there been any major locations or cities that you've had to cut for budget, time, or logistics? And Rafe answered, this is perhaps the biggest source of changes for us. Even with the massive amount of money that Amazon has kindly given us to bring this world to life, to go to as many unique cities, villages, locations as they do in the books is simply impossible. We have chosen to do a few places extremely well, both culturally and with production design, instead of a dozen places cheaply and badly. This results in many changes that have huge ripple effects. If you can't go to Berlon, do you still meet men? Do you encounter the White Cloaks? Do you have dreams of Alzaman, etc.? I'm betting that most of the things that feel the most unnecessarily changed to people from the books, even if they're hugely separated from that specific location, will be born out of a location-specific change. So I know this answer won't make some people happy, but again, it is completely necessary when adapting a series the scale of the Wheel of Time. You cannot recreate every location. They have to decide if it makes sense to include more locations at lower quality or fewer, but make them exceptional. They chose to go the exceptional route, and I agree with that decision. Barring that nothing so major as to change the entire trajectory of the story with one of the cuts. That's my caveat there. Now, there's always going to be collateral damage when cutting something, though. An example of that that Rafe gives is Barillon. I do think that Barillon probably will be cut. We've been predicting that for a while, especially considering that we know Min doesn't show up in the filming until block four. I'm sure that's a tough decision. And Rafe is going to bring this up here again in a minute, so we'll come back to it. But I, I think that cuts were going to happen. Locations are going to be cut, and we know that. So Rafe was asked, do you attempt to keep book dialogue or start from scratch? And Rafe answered, every writer receives a document when they begin their script put together by our book expert, Sarah that breaks down every scene in the episode and gives specific dialogue and scene references from the books for it. Especially the scenes that aren't from the books at all, we will find scenes from the books with the same characters together or talking about the same thing thematically. That said, predictably, almost all of the dialogue in the show is not from the books as to sound as natural as possible with our locations, actors, and scenes as they're played. I, I don't have any major issues with this. I'm really not looking for a word for word adaptation of the books. And I would think that some of the dialogue from the books would actually sound weird or cheesy on a modern television adaptation as compared to the page. So I think this is kind of an obvious, yeah, of course, they're gonna have to change some of the dialogue. Sarah did say later that there are some scenes that are word for word, some of the things that were said in the book, but I don't think they're setting out to do that and I'm glad they're not. So Rafe was asked, how far through the series did you consider when making changes? in terms of repercussions. And Rafe answered, we have to consider it for the entire series, which led to many in-room conversations, screaming matches where someone is like, the yellow sister healing someone in this scene cannot be Chesmal Emery. Are you kidding me? Do you know anything about Chesmal Emery? What did you do? Google a random yellow sister and pick one that you liked? F you and your yellow sister. It's not going to be effing Chesmal Emery. I guarantee you that. Which by the way, I have to say, there is nothing like being on a live breakdown of all of these Q&A questions on the Dusty Wheel and watching Matt Hatch, who's about the nicest person that you'll ever meet in the world, having to tiptoe around some colorful language from Rafe. That made my day. But in any case, this little exchange just shows that they are certainly taking the entire series into account when they're making the show. They are making this with the intention of making it all the way to the end. 
So that would include factoring in things that happen later and possibly setting up some of those things in the seasons to come. Rafe was asked, have you made any changes that hurt you or Sarah to make but were necessary for the screen? And he answered, the writer's room floor is littered with my tears. Truly though, I don't want people to be unprepared for how different the show is to the books. To do a proper adaptation, it has to be. As a thought exercise, just imagine that we can only do four cities from the eye of the world. So from Emmonsfield, Tar and Ferry, Bearlawn, Shadar Logoth, White Bridge, Four Kings, Breen Spring, Camelin, and Faldara, which would you choose? What are the knock-on effects for each character in the story from the ones you don't go to? What characters haven't met each other now, and how can you reconnect them? We have amazing writers and a hugely helpful support in Brandon and Harriet to tackle these issues, but they're not small. Gird your loins, my friends. I love that Rafe is being upfront about this, and I don't think he's wrong. Many of us have been saying this for a long time. It's complete wishful thinking to believe that they could recreate a series with more than 2,600 named characters, more than 15 individual nations and cultures, a complex magic system and background to all of the story, and a story which spans 15 books that are almost 500,000 words long each, and not be forced to make changes to make that into a TV series. If you are a book purist who is going to be absolutely disgusted if they even change someone's eye color, which I know you're out there because you comment on a lot of videos, I'm sorry, but you probably shouldn't ever watch adaptations in general. I would challenge someone to bring up one successful adaptation that doesn't include major changes from the books. This is an absolute reality whether you want it to be or not, and that's not meant to hurt your feelings or anything like that. It's just prepare yourself because these things have to change. It's a reality, it's not a choice. It's not like they decided, do we want to do it word for word or not? They have to not do it. They can't make it word for word. Now what I am happy about here is that we have a fan at the helm and we have the backing of the team that gave us the books. I have seen nothing that makes me think that we're not getting at anything other than an adaptation that will remain faithful to the heart and the plot of the books while making changes that will make it fresh and new for us major fans that are also gonna bring in new viewers. Guys, this has to bring in new viewers or it will not get a full run, period. Now let's take a look at Rafe's little thought exercise here as well. He mentions picking four cities from Eye of the World. Now this is probably just a thought exercise. This is probably not him saying they only made four cities, but it also could possibly be a reality. We know that Emmonsfield, Tar and Ferry, Shadar Logoth and Faldara will already be in the adaptation as we know those sets were made and we've heard of leaks from there. But does that mean that that's all we're getting? I don't, I don't think it is, but it's probably not far off. So Rafe was then asked, what made you change Tom from playing the liar to a guitar? And Rafe answered, Tom is a good example of the changes we made for the show. For one, I want characters to appear when we have the time to spend to properly introduce them and to get enough scenes for them to attract a great actor for the role. You will never see scenes on this show where four random people appear say two lines and then disappear for seasons. It just won't get you the caliber of actor you need and it doesn't properly intro that character to the audience. So for Tom, we wanted to give him a proper introduction. And we also wanted to have a strong masculine energy that made him a counterpoint to Moraine. We saw actors of all ages, races, and vibes to play Tom, but when Alex Willem's tape came through, we knew he was Tom and moved toward uh, his vibe for the character, which was a younger and grittier than the books Tom. The guitar looks much more fitting in his hands and with his voice than a liar. And when he stomps onto the stage in the show, it is a moment. And we wanted that for Tom. Never fear, multicolored cloak is still in existence, but different than you can imagine. Isis, our costume designer, nailed it. So here is Rafe explaining his choice to use a guitar rather than a harp or a flute. Now I know some people are just absolutely infuriated at this change and honestly I don't get it. It doesn't change anything about who Tom is as a character and Alexandra Willem is a really good musician by the way. If he can shine with a guitar and give us dynamic performances that are going to connect with modern audiences, I have zero issues with changing this to a guitar. In fact, I kind of welcome it. I think a guitar not only fits the, uh, thematically with the time period, but it's also gonna break away from the cheesiness that many associate with like medieval fantasy. I love this change and I understand that some of you don't. And that's honestly fine. But if your reaction is to say, F this show, they changed Tom's instrument. And so I'm sure they're gonna change everything else and screw it all up. You should probably stay away from adaptations as I said earlier. 
My suggestion is just to be open to changes and judge it for what it is once it's out, rather than deciding that you're not going to watch something because of one small change. There have been many adaptations where people were infuriated that they didn't make Tyrion Lannister ugly, and it worked out okay for Game of Thrones. There, There's lots of examples of this. It's just such a strange and foreign reaction to me to say I'm not going to watch something because they made X small change. I. I can't get behind that. I've been waiting for this for so long that there's really not much that's going to give me, that's going to keep me from at least giving it a chance once it's out. That's just me, though. The last question, and this one was actually on Twitter, is how much of the monster, trollic, fade, drakkar design is being done practically versus digital effects? Mostly makeup and prosthetics. And with that, how closely does the design match the text? Totally smooth faces on fades, varieties of trollocs, etc. And Rafe answered, We have worked hard to use many practical effects and pieces as possible for trollocs and fades, but I don't want to spoil all the secrets until you watch the behind the scenes after the first season developing. So I love this answer, and it's one that he's given before. Practical effects are so much better than pure CGI, in my opinion. The other thing I love about this is the fact that he mentions the behind the scenes stuff again. I literally can't wait for that. I'm pretty pumped. So my overall thoughts on the changes, Tom's flute, where he's being introduced, all the dramatic stuff. Well, I'm pretty much fine with most of it. I think the guitar is a great change. I haven't heard anything that's scaring me off from being excited about the series. We knew changes were coming. Just because now that we finally know what some of them are doesn't mean that the world is ending. The vast majority of people I've talked to about this actually are really excited. I know there is a vocal minority that seems to think that the sky is falling and that this is going to be the worst adaptation in history because they chose a guitar rather than uh, a flute for some reason. But I personally think that this is going to be great because I think it thematically fits the, mu the actor's musical talents way better than a flute would. Like I said earlier, I have a lot of trouble empathizing with the whole crowd that says I'm not going to watch it at all. If you want to be upset, that is your prerogative. But I'm going to choose to be excited genuinely and cheer for the success of the adaptation that I've been waiting more than 20 years for. Until I see it and it's a bag of hot garbage, then I'll say that if it is at that time. But I'm not going to freak out over changing an instrument. And actually, I think it's probably a great change. So absolutely let me know what you think in the comments of the video. What are your thoughts on Rafe's Q&A? All the stuff that we announced, the video with the, the guitar. Let's hear it. Put it down in the comments below. Let's get a conversation started. Additionally, remember to check out Bespoke Post and start your subscription service. It is so worth it. That link, again, is down in the description. And also check out the Patreon to support the channel. This channel is never going to be super, super massive, and this type of content takes a lot of work. And so for those of you that support the channel, you guys are so appreciated. You really help keep this going. Y'all are the best. You can check the link in the description of this video to see how you can support. Speaking of patrons, I want to thank Jennifer Wood. She is one of my top tier patrons. She's been a supporter of the channel. She's an awesome person. She sent me a Christmas gift that I can't wait. It's actually a bunch of books written by Martha Wells. Uh, they're from Tor, which is the same company that brought us the Wheel of Time. So I will be reading these. Thank you so much for the Christmas present. You're the best, Jennifer. Guys, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. Again, that's what I do here. I have a whole bunch more coming before the new year. Thanks for watching, everybody, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. A mistress up above, slipping on a robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free, crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?